All right. So um, thank you for tuning in to Sindel's Razor today. Today I am talking about libertarianism, something that people who know me are they're very well aware that I uh, that the philosophy that I like to follow, or at least, at least I think this third party is the way to go to find some actual change, because this red versus blue duopoly is not getting anything done for us. And I think now is the time when getting in contact with people who are trying to make this change and move the government towards a more liberty-minded focus, I think it's an important thing for to do. So today I have uh, Joe, I'm so sorry, Hanush? Hanush. Hanush, I'm so sorry, man. Sneeze. Hanush. <laughs> God bless you. Um, on to so talk to me today, he is running for Congress under the Libertarian banner. And so right now I just want to give the floor to, uh, to Joe. Thank you for coming on with me. If you want to talk about, so what got you into libertarianism, what libertarianism to you and why you, uh, decided you want to run for Congress. Wow. Those are like long answers to those I know, questions. I know. So basically it's going to be the whole conversation I just laid out right there. Let's start notes for right there. But if I, let's start with like what, what's what, what is libertarianism, I guess, for those that may not be an issue. Let's start with the very basic. So how would you define libertarianism? Yeah, libertarianism is basically, it's uh, it's a limited government, maximum individual liberty. So basically, you could do whatever you want as long as you, what you, your actions don't infringe on the rights for other people. So it, like another phrase is, like, you know, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's not exactly libertarian, but uh, basically, you know, just treat everyone with mutual respect. Uh, yeah. Make every, every interaction consensual, you know. As long as you're not, you know, again, like don't harm people, don't take their stuff, and that's it. I mean, basically, do whatever you want as long as you're not harming other people. I love that. Yeah. So I got turned on to libertarianism or the Libertarian Party um, during 2012 with Ron Paul's presidential candidate, uh, presidential run. And even though he was running as a Republican, I remember there's a certain moment when he was at a Republican debate with all the Republican candidates in South Carolina of all places, and they brought something up about uh, they were talking about marijuana decriminalization. Or something he was asked a question related to like well, well you know would you decriminalize heroin and ron was like yeah and then the whole crowd and he's like listen like how many of you if heroin became decriminalized tomorrow are going to run out there grab some needles and shoot up and the entire crowd it's right now it was a republican crowd in south carolina in 2012 so like the entire crowd it erupted in, in applause and that's when i realized like you know what like just because something isn't great doesn't mean it should be illegal just because something is illegal doesn't mean that People, you know, should they're going to run out and do it because, like, if, if, you, if you if you say, okay, heroin, we're not going to arrest you if you got a little bit of heroin on you, or we're not going to send you to jail, lock you in a cage for decades, and ruin your entire life because you, you know, had a little bit of a substance on you. It, it's not the like, society's not going to break down. Right. I think I think that uh, like that maximum individual liberty is the way to go. And so one way that I always I started so like for a long time, I would always say like, oh, like, well, what's your political view as a libertarian? As a libertarian, somebody. A lot of times people would say, oh, we're, we're more socially liberal, fiscally conservative. But like now it's those two other parties, those liberal and, you know, parties get more and more further apart. Like we're not really either of those. Like it was something right. Spike Cohen actually um, said that I thought was fantastic. Uh, Spike Cohen was the, um, the libertarian candidate for vice president for the last election and uh, under George Jorgensen's campaign. And I think one of the best things that happened for that campaign is him really becoming uh, to the forefront in a lot of uh, libertarian politics. I think he is a great messenger for the ideals. He's super knowledgeable. He knows his stuff. But he said, I think he tweeted actually, um, like it's fiscally, it's, it's, it's socially, it's your business. Fiscally, it's your money. And I think having massive control over your life is is the way to go about it. So that's why I'm more excited to have more people like you who are jumping on these ideologies and like, hey, let's let's make some actual change. So so now we know where libertarianism kind of stands for us. Where uh, so what got you motivated to run a run for Congress? Yeah, so for for Congress, it was like basically the next step um, to talk about different issues, right? Because I had a run for state representative in 2018 and 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was like, you know, I wanted to run three times as a libertarian. So this is my third chance. And because of the U.S. Census in 2020, there's redistricting, right? And when there's redistricting of the of the maps, there you can get like petitions, which is you know one method to qualify for the for the ballot from anywhere in the state, for if you're running for state or uh, federal office. So what I did was I was like, okay, cool, I could collect petitions from anywhere. This will make it a little bit easier to do. Still very difficult, but a lot easier to do. So I decided, and, and I could talk about you know not just state issues, but federal issues now. Right. So I decided to uh, you know, run for federal office and reach uh, 
five times more like more voters in that district compared to the state house a district. Mm -hmm. So I could reach more, you know, more voters, more area and talk about different issues. So, you know, more libertarian, uh, you know, viewpoint of those issues. So that's why I decided to run for Congress for that one. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's something that I think is it's, it's really just a prime time to get some of these ideas out there, because now like people are seeing every single time they go to the gas pumps consequences of not Ukraine, not Biden, not even necessarily just Trump, like decades and decades of yeah. terrible fiscal policy between the, the, the unconstitutional Federal Reserve just printing checks all the time. The inflation is running rampant. Like, like libertarians have been, been pulling the alarm on this inflation thing for a long time. Yeah. And now as soon as it hits, we're like, oh, if only someone was warning you about this 10 years ago when you yeah. had the first quantitative easing during the wars and stuff like that, right? That was us, yes. Right. Like we so so like if you want to talk about consistency, like a lot of people will say, like, oh, Bernie Sanders, I don't like his stuff, I like that he's consistent. Like, we'll look to the gold party. We've been consistent for a long time. Yeah. You know, and, and again, it's it's we see what happens with the red versus blue. It's this two sides of the same coin. Tulsi Gabbard, when right. she left Congress, she straight up was telling everyone, she's like, listen, like they'll, they'll put on a show for everyone as if they hate each other. But then as soon as the cameras are off or sessions closed, they're making they're hanging out, making friends. Like it's all just it's it's just crony corporatism and integrating with the government. It's really gross. I really would love to see more people like you get in there. So. Yeah, it, it it's all an act in Congress. I mean, you hear like Justin Amash and Thomas Massey, they'll talk about it. And they'll be like, you know, there, there's literally, you get elected to Congress and you, you have an orientation with your, your, your respective political party. And they basically say, you're going to vote this way on a bill, how we want you to, or we're going to primary you. We're not going to give you any money. You're not going to be on any committees or anything like that. Mm -hmm. that it's cronyism. I mean, it, it really is two political parties pretending to be against each other, but they're all working on the same side. You know, occasionally they'll vote against it, but whenever they do come together and compromise or whatever, it's to grow government, to infringe on your rights, to take more of your money. And that's, it's both parties doing it. You just look at history. Trump did it, you know, Obama did it, Bush did it, it so on and so forth. Both parties yeah. doing it. And a great example in recent history is you look at the, the different bills that were passed for uh, the COVID relief stuff. And like the stimulus packages, that kind of stuff. If you actually look at what's in, like, in some of these bills, first off, they got, they got like, hundreds of pages set on their decks hours before they're going to vote on it like these these aren't these are pet project bills everyone's just throwing in whatever they want giving it a catchy name so it sounds like if you're against it then you're against uh well, like the, the patriot act the, the patriot oh if you're a patriot you'll, you'll, you'll do this like the fact that you know if you're a patriot you're voting for it no if you're, you're if you want all the rights that make you a patriot start getting eroded away you'll be spied on by the nsa you want to get data aggregate collection happening i mean it's, I mean, we could, we could easily tangent on multiple different things, but like, yeah. like accountability is something that I think uh, our government has very, very little of. And I think that's something, like you mentioned that um, um, term limits are something that you would be for. Um, right. when you guys do. So what, what kind of term limits would you be looking at? Yeah, and you mentioned accountability. That's part of it. Like I have something called the ABC policy and A stands for accountability. I mentioned the C already, uh, consent and or constitution. I'm like set which one I want there yet, <laughs> but consent or constitution. And consent really is in line with constitution because like, okay, the, like the Bill of Rights is like telling the settling government, you can't do this unless I give you permission to basically, or I won't do it myself. So that's the consent and constitution part. Uh, but the, yeah, the term limits, it again, is for, for accountability. You, you know, we're not supposed to have career politicians. You go there, you do you do your service is really what it is, and then you come back, and that's it. You go back to your regular job. You're not supposed to be making two and a half times the median income for the country, hundred seventy four thousand dollars a year, for this you know this job where you basically go live in D.C. Like you don't, I mean, those right. people aren't, aren't like from their states anymore. Right, like, they have you know, no Joe idea. Not from Delaware anymore, you know, Maryland or whatever. I like, heard. I was watching some of the January six hearings. I heard somebody talk about. Um, like what gas prices were in their district. And I'm like, well, at least you know what they are. Like I doubt Nancy Pelosi's ever gotten gas in her district, you know? But I mean, that goes for many, many people in uh, in that giant corrupt organization as well. But so like something, I'll spend train of thought real quick. I was gonna say something else, but anyway, there's just so so many things I wanna talk about here that I think are really cool. So let's let's talk about some of your stories some though. Cause you mentioned um, that your parents are, are immigrants and immigration of course is something that's a, a hot topic right now and libertarians i've seen libertarians go both ways on this the party doesn't really seem to have a a one stance on it which i like i like the diversity of thought in the conversation that arises i've seen some that are very open borders i've seen others that say like you for instance say like an ellis island approach so if you want to explain some of that i'd be very happy about that 
Yeah, it, and you know, when it comes to like immigration, it is one of the divisive issues in the Libertarian Party. And here's the, I'm going to steal a quote from Larry Sharp, and he said, "You could be being a libertarian. You could be as conservative or as liberal as you want to be. Just don't use government force to enforce your ideas, right? No, so you can keep close borders. It's fine, right?" But uh, as far as like what I go for, and I have this personal experience, my parents immigrated here to escape a tyrannical government. My parents are from Iraq, right? Oh, so wow. they grew up there. Yeah. So it was one of those, you know, hot countries, really. And they left right as Saddam Hussein was taking power. So they came to the United States. They came here legally. Um, I was the first person born in my, my family, actually, um, you know, here in the United States. And, you know, they spoke the language already. And, uh, you know, they celebrate the holidays. Like I go to, to you know, um, Thanksgiving, you know, my parents spoke all the <laughs> yeah. time, right? That's an American holiday. We didn't have Thanksgiving in Iraq. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like everything, you know, the pay their taxes, they haven't gone to jail as far as I know. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're small business owners. And, you know, to me, that's the American dream. They came to the land of opportunity here in the United States and they fulfilled the American dream. I've seen that firsthand. So I'm thinking, like, okay, these people, my parents, escaped that tyrannical government. By the way, my dad voted for Donald Trump twice. So, People like Republicans like to say like, oh, they're just, these immigrants coming in here and vote Democrat. No, they're not. See, the, they're the Cuban population voted for him in the last election substantially more. Like there are a, a lot of people that I know who are either like like related to or know first generation immigrants are are voting so that they, they don't want everyone to come rushing in here and taking advantage of these systems that they're trying to use as opportunity to, to take care of themselves. Right. Yeah, and, and that's another thing is like the other one is the they're you know they're coming here to take you know welfare or whatever. Okay. So you have an issue with welfare. So sunset some of the welfare and make it go to where it's supposed to be, like, you know, churches and, you know, other civic organizations, like, you know, local organizations that could help with that. Yeah, I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what churches are for, right? To help the, yeah. the community. There you go. So let's sunset some of the, the government welfare and go to a more, probably a far more efficient and um, uh, tax, um, you know, they, they already don't pay taxes, right? So right. they could use some of those services. I think. I think that's probably part of, of the point, you know? Yeah. So yeah so I, I would... A lot of times people will say, like, like when I say something like, I think these, like, these social programs are, you know, inefficient and terrible, they think like, oh, well, you just don't want people to, to you know, you just hate poor people, or you don't want these marginalized communities to be able to get access to your stuff that you have, you're privileged, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, it's not, it's not that I don't want them to have access to you know, some help. Like I, I, when I, I, I was out of work for a little bit when um, COVID hit. And so I, I got some state, you know, some of that taxes I pay into it. Some of that came back to me when I needed it. That needs to be available. A safety net should be available. Right. I just don't think the way we're doing it now is an efficient way to do it. When it comes to even Medicare and Medicaid, rife with fraud or, or fraud with uh, fraud. And it's, 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 they're inefficient check writing machines. A lot of times the money is being to be taken advantage of. Resources aren't going where they need to go. Whenever you have a top-down system trying to help people out like that, it's not going to happen very well. I do like the idea of having, you know, increasing the charitable aspects, having having community outreach. Like now we're just saying like, oh, we're trying to write you a check, send it wherever. It's like, no, well, the churches you're talking about, well, they know where who needs help in the community. So they're usually the ones right. that have the soup kitchens. So they're the ones that are feeding these homeless people. These are the ones that have these different connections to know exactly where these resources need to go. And I just don't think government is efficient at um, getting any of that done because they've proven time and time again that they're not. Uh, yeah, churches are literally part of the community. I mean, you know, people know where they are. They, they, like I said, they have soup kitchens. That's what it's supposed to do. I mean, I'm not saying like, you know, I agree with you with the safety net. I'm not saying pull the plug on every, you know, right, welfare yeah. thing tomorrow or anything. I'm saying like, let's start to sunset some of those things. Like, you know, if, if like you said about like, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the paycheck stuff, right? The, the, you know, the, you know, if you, you're, you're paying into it, right. So you should get it back. I know some people will be like, oh, there's no libertarians in a pandemic. I guess there are. Like those checks we got, those, that's our money. It's like right. the government is giving it back to us. So I'm like, okay, of course I'm going to take it and yeah. cash it with my money. Right. So, yeah. Well, especially a situation where, like, that's a weird situation too. People that, that, that some people have, have said that to me as well. They're like, oh, wait, like, you took a check from the government during the pandemic. Like, well, A, it's my tax money in the first place. Right. But, but B, like, this is not like you have the, the reason I can't work is because the government shut it down. They were deemed, they right. deemed me unessential. Right. So if you're going to say I can't work and take away my ability to care for myself, you better give that back. And that's why, that's why I, I, I get so sketch about things like, um, being able to determine who's who's if uh, essential and who is not. Yeah. Like if you're supporting yourself and a family, every job's essential. 
hundred percent. Especially when you're so hypocritical about it, when you say like, oh, these small mom and pop restaurants and grocery stores or like like farmers markets, these aren't essential. You can't have these. No, they have Walmart's it. open, Target's open, and they're making a record profits. Like everyone's con- everyone's like, oh, these corporations, they don't care about you. They're doing all this stuff. Like the reason they're making all this extra money, these record profits, is because they the government shut down all the mom and pop places. Like over 50% of small businesses that shut down during the pandemic were not going to ever reopen. Maybe higher than that. That's a stat from Yelp I read a year ago. Yeah, I think like Amazon stock, which basically does all the shipping stuff. Everyone like couldn't go to Walmart anymore or any, you know, mom and pop or whatever. They had to get shipping done, right? Because everyone said, oh, yeah, the government told you you're going to die if you leave your house, right? So I think it was on the whitehouse.gov or whatever that actually said, uh, if, if you're vaccinated, you, you go enjoy your family on Thanksgiving. But if you're an unvaccinated, you're probably going to kill them or something. I don't, I don't know. It was something about like, the word. The wording is during the Biden administration, I believe. It was like a, it's like a, a season of death and disability. I think those yeah. words were used somewhere in it. But like the entire thing was just very, it's, it's high up a lot. Yeah, and, and and people, I think I'm I'm fine with the government giving information. Like the CCD, if they want to, you know, Biden, whoever, Trump, whoever it is, give information. You know, make it factual and everything, but don't mandate things like oh. If you're a nurse, you've been working in the pandemic for a year and a half now, but now you have to get vaccinated or you lose your job. That makes no sense. Like, they, that's insanity. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. It was Literally, absolutely... nurses, a year and a half through this pandemic, work in the front lines, and now you're telling them if you don't get this vaccination, you get fired? That's crazy. It's like, it's, it's they, they turn so it's so quick from from hometown heroes to uh, plague spreaders real fast. And as soon as they were like, wait, I don't want this mandatory vaccination, you know. And it's 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 been interesting watching different reactions to when you put pressure on society. Where the pressure comes from, whether it be real pressure from an actual pandemic, or then you have or you know more trumped up pressure coming from a government's overreaction to that pandemic. You see, you can see what starts to happen, the way society starts to shift. And uh, 2020 was just such a, a, a complete S show of a year. It's, um, it got, it, I mean, we had pandemics, we had riots, like we were playing Apocalypse Bingo. You had most of that card filled out. There was a fire in Australia, I think in January of that year that everyone forgot two months that's later. That's right. It started, it was devastating. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Well, and they, there we, was protests in China, I think just before that, like in December, I think of the year prior. In, in you know the Middle East uprising in countries and everywhere, there was a lot of stuff going on <laughs> that just like completely went away from you know the front pages of media because of you know the pandemic worldwide pandemic. And then, that's and, something and, 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 you mentioned the gas price. So I want to hit that for one second because oh, I've seen so please. much, so many people um, say like this is oh this is Biden's fault. I I I, I miss the mean tweets from the orange Cheeto or whatever. <laughs> right. I'm not I'm not calling them that. This these are what people I've seen like say. You know, because gas prices were so low during 2020. And I'm like, gas prices were so low because there was a, a huge inventory. You know, the supply chain wasn't disrupted yet. And, you know, everyone was staying home just like like that, like basically overnight, right? So, of course, prices are going to go down, go down. That's supply and demand, exactly. right? Exactly. And now we still have part of that supply chain that needs to catch up. But we have, like, everyone is basically out and about and doing their thing again. Much so that's going, to be, that's going to cause, yeah, high demand and low supply or, or like kind of backed up supply causes higher prices. Now, of course, Biden's policies and Trump policies has a little something to do with that. But for the most part, it's supply and demand based on the world governments. Right. So, yeah. So everyone's looking at what it's, it's the role. I don't know why anyone would want to be president anymore. Like, hey, hey, the office has been so bloated and overpowerful over time that it, it's not even what it's meant to be in the first place. So it's to be like a figurehead position. You're not, you, you don't have that much power anyway. Now everyone looks at the most powerful man in the world. It should never have been the most powerful person in the world in that office. I, I agree 100%. And, and I tell people that all the time when Biden was on office, or you know, he's still at his office, but when Trump was in Biden, in office, well, his body's in the office, but his mind yeah. has not ever been there. <laughs> I said it's my that, words. That, that's my words. Like, and, I, and I saw some uh, meme, I think it was today or yesterday, where it was like, we have someone with a uh, uh, mental health, and again, it's not me saying it, someone else is saying it, with uh, <laughs> mental health, you know, uh, issues with the, you know, his finger on the nuclear weapons button. But these, these same people are saying that, you know, the average Joe out there might have a mental illness and can't own a, you know, an AR-15 or whatever. Right, and right. That's a good point. That's a good point. And that, that's why I'm saying, like, government shouldn't be making these decisions for everybody. You know, murder, last time I checked, is still illegal. No matter what you use, you can go and, and choke someone to death, run them over a car, 
stab him with a knife or shoot him with a gun, all that is bad. All that is illegal. So why are you, you know, weaponizing or trying to ban one weapon or that? I mean, we're not banning knives, we're not banning cars, uh, drunk driving. You know, it, it's a person making a decision to drink and then go drive. Right. And someone dies based on that. Are we banning the car? Right. No, no one's suing Ford because someone got behind it with a you know point oh nine and hit, hit uh, someone else. You know, it's right. I mean someone probably is, but um, but the point there, the point there is is it's the individual. Like we already have laws saying don't do this. So yes. now the idea is so, so I just to to try to devil's advocate the, um, the argument a little bit. I'm 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 very pro second A. I think every gun law is basically an infringement, but. Um, I, I like to I like to try to bridge gaps between understanding. Like, well, because we, I mean, if I say something like that, it seems like I'm a radical that wants to buy tanks and RPGs and stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, but also there's there's some more <laughs> radical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't <laughs> afford it. It's inflation, but um, <laughs> but like, so the idea would be okay. So we have like these these atrocities keep happening with you know these certain tools. Okay, well, let's restrict access to those tools. But if we look at the actual data behind um, gun violence in the United States, the overwhelming majority of firearm deaths are the result of of handguns. At Columbine, um, those were a couple of handguns they had. So like at the end of the day, if someone wants to shoot up a school, like yeah, okay, they may be a little sufficient if they don't have a thirty round mag. But at the end of the day, there's still ways to get that done. And like then the core problem is our kids are still unsafe. They're still vulnerable, and you still have people that want to do this in the first place. Now, right. you're not going to get rid of people that you, you can't eliminate the, the the variable of bad actors from society's equation. You'll always have um, right. malfeasance. You're always going to have people that want to sow chaos, especially with conditions like this and the mental health crisis that's happening we're seeing every day. That's going to get worse, not better. So there has to be a way we can live with maximum liberty but also protect ourselves as well. And I think this, I think this boils down to – there's a school in Palmetto, Florida, a little bit above Bradenton, that I have not substantiated any of this myself. It's something I saw from someone that, that tends to get to school there. But they have armed private security, I guess. They're not, they're not, they're not uniformed, except for a, uh, a, a vest, like a Kevlar-style vest that has um, like security officer or something like that on it, holding a long rifle. And um, it's very, very, very visible next to the metal detectors outside the front of the school. They have, they've limited points of entry and access, and those points of entry and access are guarded by someone with basically a BFG. And he's got a big freaking gun, and he's showing everyone, like, hey, I'm, I'm here to deter it and also stop it when it happens. And I think the, 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 the completely negligent display of the Uvalde Police Department during this last shooting in Texas shows that, okay, well, you want, you want only the police to have guns, well, what are they going to do with them? Arrest the parents who are trying to rescue their kids while someone else with a gun inside is tearing them all up? Like, who, happened, yeah. and who ended up stopping it? It was like, like he was law enforcement, but it wasn't working. A guy off duty happened to have a gun. It was the one that went in there and did it. Not the uniformed police officer on our duty. No, and then I have a lot of friends who are law enforcement. I've worked law enforcement as a paramedic for a lot of my career. And I know that's not the majority of, of, of the way they feel about it. But the bottom line is, it doesn't matter if the majority of them feel that way or not. If, if, if someone else besides you is the one responsible for your protection, you're not really protected. I guess my, that's, uh, the, that's the, my rant there. <laughs> no, no, and, and you're exactly right. And, and one point I want to stress is that no matter what happens, we could ban all guns tomorrow like that, or we could, you know, uh, repeal all, all gun laws and say, like, oh, we're having a bunch of good guys with guns. No matter any of that happens, we're still going to have these mass shootings, no matter what. It, there's no silver bullet, no pun intended, to any of that. It's, right. it's, it's still going to happen. Uh, that's the, just the reality of it. No one's really talked about that. Like, oh, we're going to end all gun violence if we do this. That's not true. It's still going to happen. Right. So, and and how it, many cases? Because they don't. It's, it's hard to record um, data on how many people, like right, shootings were stopped by someone, an armed citizen. Um, right, because it it, it's hard to record. Right. Because it didn't happen. So how are you going to record it? You know. Yeah. So, but like, every. I think I've seen videos of like, you know, women about to get robbed and she pulls, she pulls a piece out of her purse or somewhere else that was concealed and that it's an equalizer. It protects people. If we have, if yeah. we have people running rampant, I mean, we're not talking about having some of the same people that, that are insistent that the United States and, and culture in general has, has rape culture, but you want to disarm women so they're vulnerable. Yeah. There's just a lot of, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance with a lot of these arguments that like, it's, it's an emotionally based argument. You see dead kids, you hear, um, right. Actors hop up in the White House and give really emotionally filled speeches. Like, yes, I, it's, it's devastating. But then what happens a lot of times during the discussion is it's, it's not um, it's not earnest on both sides. A lot of times, those like and, and it's usually the Democratic Party that is calling for um, and treating stuff like the Protect Our Kids Act, which which is banning certain rounds of magazines, high capacity stuff. And the definitions for high capacity and mass shooter change willy nilly based on what you're trying to get past. 
Um, right. The FBI didn't have a consistent definition for it. They changed it twice. They, they upgraded, it was like a mass shooting event was like three people in one incident. Now it's like upgraded to five. Oh, there was five and then downgraded to three. So now you have more mass shootings based on the criteria changing for the, the shooting definition. So it's a conversation yeah. that has to be had, honestly, and you have to give a good a good effort to understand where each person's coming from. So, like, and, you know, and there's plenty of good points to be made on the side of like, yeah, like other countries may not have the same race of firearm violence, but we have, you know, we have more firearms than people. Like at this point, and with the advent of 3D printing too, like there's no way to control access to firearms in the United States. Yep. Plus, yep. again, the ATF went in Operation Fast and Furious, that debacle, when they went and tried, they're trying to track down uh, uh, cartels, right? So they gave all these firearms to these Mexican cartels and they're like, oh, we'll track them with, with, with tracking the weapons and stuff. Lost all of them, if not most, like if not most, all of them. And there's zero accountability there at all. So like the, 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 the ATF can't even keep track of this stuff. You think anyone else is going to be able to? Right. Absolutely exactly. not. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's like, I, I would say like, you know, a ban on guns is really the same as a ban on drugs, right? Drugs are still everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's the like, biggest thing. It's, like, like, it's just not going to work. Away. Yeah, it's just not going to work. Right. Because, I mean, again, yeah. like, prohibition, alcohol, what happened there? Well, you create right. a black market, you create a lot of crime, yeah. and it was so bad, and the violence was so rampant that finally, right. like, all right, fine, we back down. Well, why are we right. not back down everything by now? Prohibition works for nothing. Why are we still thinking about it for anything? Right. It literally created violence. That, that's there, what happened. It's right. Same, if same thing with drugs. Like, if you could, if you could, uh, if weed is like perfectly legal, you just go to your Walmart or whatever and be like, I would like, whatever ounces of marijuana and go like a dispensary that we have now in some states not in florida but that's the way it would work there's there's no there's no violence in medical marijuana right except when the when the state <laughs> like makes you pay a 275 dollar right. you know, annual tax or whatever well, but what's anyway. nice so I, got, I got my medical card here in florida and uh, what's nice is there's some dispensaries um that uh, it's like a state fee of like 150 bucks to go to the state right so they uh, they're like, hey, for your first purchase, once you get your card and you come to the dispensary, they give me uh, they give me seventy five dollars off my first purchase if I spent more than one fifty. So I'm like, dope. <laughs> so I did. But if you, I meet you meet the nicest people in a lot of these dispensaries, like some of the kindest, coolest people in the medical dispensaries. So it's like, so I could walk in there. I could walk into um, a, 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 a strip mall, walk into a walk into a dispensary there, and walk out with ounces. You know, depending on my prescription, how much I'm allotted to, but I can walk out with the, I can walk out from the thump marijuana to get my home no knock rated in many states. And that's something I brought up. I was talking to someone else about no knock raids um, before too, and that was a point I brought up. It's like, look, like, like having these substances illegal, like, well, they change. Like, what happens if, if okay, let's say, let's say months ago someone got raided in no knock raid. And this person was killed. Like, oh, they had drugs. Oh, they were a bad person. Like, well, I have, I have more than that amount of the same substance in my room right now. Yep. Yeah. Do I deserve to get a bullet for it? No. Right. Like, don't put people in cages for stuff, for stuff like that, for like for possessing um, plants or it's some, some synthetic compounds where they're not going to do anything to hurt, you know, potentially themselves, but not anyone else, you know? Yeah, you see all these like municipal police department Facebook pages will, will po make this post with like, you know, the, and again, I'm, I'm friendly with a bunch of cops, by the way. It, it's fine, but there's, there's just like, it's the system that's really kind of, frankly, brainwashed them into thinking like, oh, I'm doing this good thing by, by taking cash uh gun and you know drugs from this person who otherwise didn't do anything violent to anyone else like you know a, a drug um transaction you know whether legal or illegal is based on consent like here you have this grown person saying i would like x amount of drugs for the x amount of dollars here you go and i'm willing to give it to you there you go that's it like why is government even involved in that right. whether to you know have a tax on it or to to be violent about it i mean like brianna taylor it was a, you know, a drug thing or whatever. So here's violence from the government. And, and there's violence in, in non-government too, in the black market also, like you mentioned prohibition or alcohol earlier, that created a, a violent black market there. So yeah, the government getting involved is really, it's it's not the answer at all. I know that's like people like saying, oh, you have to have the government involved in that, but yeah, have it involved, okay. But like, let's, let's regulate like onions, you know? Like, if you want to grow one in your backyard, it's not harming anyone. You're just going to have your own personal use. What's the harm? Yeah. You know? So, and, and I want to go back to, uh, like, we were talking about guns earlier in schools. I, like, And I, I read a stat that was, like, 97% of these, these you know, mass shootings or whatever happen in gun-free zones. So, maybe these gun-free zones aren't really working because, you know, these, these people that decide, they're usually young men, uh, decide to say, like, oh, I know this school 
is a gun-free zone, no one's going to have a gun. I know that. So that's where they go. And these are people that want to cause damage, right? They're not going to walk into a gun show and do that. When, when have right. you ever heard of a mass shooting and a gun and a, and a gun show? No once. It's I've never happened. That. Yeah, I know. No. And you would think all these guns, like these thousands of guns, would just get up and start shooting other people, right? Right. Like, I can't remember who said it, but wasn't with someone, I heard a quote from someone, said an armed populace is a polite populace. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, there's the, you know, there's an aspect of mutually assured destruction there. But if everyone, if everyone has the ability to protect themselves, let's say if you want, if someone wants to do something bad, but then they think about their targets. Oh, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go somewhere where I, I'm gonna have a resistance to that. You know, like if anyone wants to do a mass shooting, they're not gonna go to DC at the friggin' mall, you know, in Washington DC and start opening no. up because there's no. there's guys with guns everywhere, men and women with guns right. armed all over the place. And then the same, right. the, 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 the hypocrisy of people who advocate for gun violence or for gun uh, um, laws, restrictive gun they're laws. Surrounded by people with guns. They're surrounded by people with guns. Like Hillary Clinton tweeted something a couple of days ago, said no one needs an AR-15, and I'm like, why? Do your guards have better? Yeah. The person behind you, yeah. Right? I'm like, like, see three people in suits all around you every single time you walk anywhere. I'm like, pretty sure they've got something equivalent, if not more powerful. Yeah, like, literally the White House has, like, a, a gate around it with people with guns. Like, I remember, like, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was about, but I think, like, Trump, um, like, was tweeting out, like, live tweeting an event happening at the at the White House where he had, like, it was Cage and said, oh, we're having the special like selective service with guns and we're going to shoot anybody who comes on i'm like i can't believe this is actually happening like, this is the president right. of the united states like, like using violence gun violence on people i don't know i mean i'm not calling for anyone to go you know invade the white house no of course not the president not. but i'm just saying like yeah don't even go on a tour there we all, we all see what's happening with the january 6 hearings no. Yeah, uh, no, that could be a whole other tangent. We can go on for a while too, but uh, but yeah. So the gun issue, of course, is one that's it's, it's very prominent right now. That's something that right. libertarians are always very like. Listen, like it, yeah, and you can have access the, to these. The, yeah, and just one more point I want to make. Like, you mentioned the emotional um, uh, uh, reaction that lawmakers have to like, these gun violence right here in the state of Florida. And I was actually running for state representative at the time, so it was kind of an interesting timing. Uh, when when Parkland shooting happened, mm. and there, there was kids that students that went to the Capitol building in Tallahassee and all laid on the ground, like in the you know the rotunda there, and um, uh, one, all, a bunch of the representatives, you know, Republicans and Democrats, were saying how this impacted me to vote in legislation that raised the age to purchase a gun from eighteen to twenty one, and acted red flag laws, uh, and you know had uh, basically these RSOs, these um, you know. Officers that would be, the, yeah. yeah, that would have to be in, in uh, basically in every school um, in in Florida, and I mean it, it's just like these are infringements on rights. And, and, and to your point, you were saying like how like these women are becoming unarmed. So around that age, this 18, 19, 20 year olds, what are people doing around? You know, usually doing around that age, they're going away to college. So if someone lives in Daytona and they're going to, uh, you know, an 18, 19, 20 year old girl goes to uh you know woman goes to uh um, to you know Tallahassee or whatever to go away to college or Gainesville or whatever now they're they're unarmed they're, li they're literally not allowed to own a gun and everyone else there knows that so they're gonna you know if they're one of the types of people that want to harm other people then they're gonna harm other people knowing this good person doesn't you know have a gun this law-abiding person is, doesn't have a way to protect themselves Right. When, when you declare an area a gun-free zone, what you're saying is, here's a bunch of helpless people. Yeah. Come yeah. get them. And, yeah. And, and it's like, you know, if, if that person says, like, oh, I, I had a gun, but they go report it to the you know, local campus or whatever police, say, oh, I ha I'm a 20-year-old, I had a gun, yeah, that's how I prevented this, you know, me from getting raped or something. Mm. You can't say that because it's illegal for you, it's illegal for you to have a gun. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, if you have a drug problem or whatever, you know, you're trying to get off of drugs. You can't get help because it's illegal. You know, you get arrested instead. So it's just like you know, this government is really you know, recycling the problem. We have a high recidivism rate here. We have the United States has the highest per capita incarceration rate in the world. And Florida, by the way, if Florida was its own country. Florida would be number one in uh, per capita incarceration rates. I remember when uh, the um, I know I'm kind of going on and here with other issues. No, it's all good. There was yeah, the former felon voting rights was another big issue when I was running for state representative also. I remember that. Where did you stand yeah. on that, if you don't mind my asking? I'm curious. I cause... am for former felons getting their their rights back. I was kind of on a fence maybe at, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But when I was going out collecting petitions, talking to these voters, 
a lot of people were telling me I'm not allowed to vote. And I was like, well, why aren't you allowed to vote? I said, I'm a former felon. I was like, you know, if you, know, if you don't mind, it was, it's, you know, personal question. So you don't mind me asking what happened. And they would tell me that I was, you know, 17, 18 years old. I was hanging out with my boyfriend or girlfriend at this, this, this party or whatever. And it got raided by the cops. Everyone there got a record now and they, they lost their right to vote. And here they are 20 years later, they got little kids with them, you know, coming out of the library, which is where I collect a lot of petitions at. Mm. And they seemed like a perfectly fine person to me. They made a mistake when they were, or not even a mistake, they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time when they were 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. And now they lose their right to vote, but they're still paying taxes. So I think we fought a revolutionary war against that. And then it went, right. Yes. Yeah, so that's but, what I was going to tie into as well. Yeah. But, yeah, but that, that, I think it was like 1.5 or 1.6 million Floridians were, were had their right taken away from them because of that. That's a lot of, you know, as you know, for nonviolent very, crimes. You yeah, exactly. you've lost what the core thing that makes you an American, the ability to vote and have have, have agency in your governance and your self governance, but that you can't self govern anymore. Yeah. You know, now if you've got uh, so certain crimes like violent crimes, we're talking about like um, uh, violent sexual assault against against yeah. women or minors or anybody and minors. Right. Um, if you if you if you do go shoot up a school or something like that or gun crimes like that, okay, no, you probably shouldn't have access to firearms. If you if you you've lost your privileges, you abuse it, you lose it, you know. But if you get caught with a bunch of weed or you know, a baggie of white powder at a party, something like that, and you can't you can't en en enact your rights after that, you can't defend yourself, you can't have access to a firearm, you can't vote. Like your ultimate, like like everyone's talking about, like democracy is so important that we're sending eighty billion dollars of weapons to Ukraine to arm their citizens, be around disarm ours, and then say that you know they're, they're, we're you're just not as important. Like what are we doing? Yeah. I know it doesn't make sense. It's government it's, hypocrisy, which is nothing right. new, really. No, no, yeah, it's the status quo, unfortunately. No, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like take a slightly different um, uh, opinion on the like if you're a former felon or whatever. And, yeah. and this, that, 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 um, that bill, that well, not a bill, it was a constitutional amendment that passed, uh, did not um, include uh, former like violent felons or no. ones for sexual. Yeah, right, so they were still, they still yeah. don't have the right to vote. Okay, so right, yeah, so, like, actually, so that bill in particular would not give that. So that, that bill, I was in the, I ended up supporting that bill because it, it, it nonviolence um, felons right. basically would get some of their rights back, and a lot of the stuff that right. makes people a felon is for nonviolent reasons is absurd and shouldn't be a crime in the first place, much less a felony. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely the same page. So that was, I thought was a good thing. Yeah, it, th there's one kind of kind of mixed bag with it though. It's like if someone is being released, this is a government deciding. Okay, you're your sentence is over or whatever, you're back out in public, right? Mm. So if, you, if the government deemed you to be, you know, not a danger to society basically anymore by releasing you from, from jail or prison, then shouldn't you have your rights back? I mean, why, why are you still not allowed to own a gun if people said, if the government decided you're free to go, you know? Right. So, so the, the but, idea but, is you serve your time and you're corrected, right? Like you're, right. you're reformed. <laughs> yeah, that, that does, which doesn't happen, of course. No. But it, it, it's, it's kind of like Catch-22, because if you, if you do say, okay, you get all your rights back, you don't want a gun, vote, you get your, your record, your background, you know, record sponge, then I think government will be like, okay, well, maybe the, these sentences should be longer, right, in the prison. And then that's like where, well, I don't want people in prison either, right, uh, like for a long amount of time. If you robbed a store with a gun, and then you should, you get like a 30-year sentence in prison because you, you know, were, you know, rough spot. It's, I'm not saying it's okay. But I'm just saying right. you were at a rough point in your life. You had no money. You had a family. You had to pay the bills, whatever. So you wanted to steal two hundred dollars just to make, you know, to feed your family for the week or whatever. You know, is it okay? No, it's not okay. But uh, I don't think you have. You should have your life ruined over something that, like, you know, like that, basically. But I don't know. That's my, that's my opinion. It, it's it's very probably very uh, divisive within the Libertarian yeah. Party, frankly. Yeah. I think well for that one, I, it's, it's it goes to this this it ties into this basically this this culture of of just suppressing people, throwing them in cages for a long time. So the the racket that is the the prison industry, where you have for profit prisons, or you have budgets being decided based on inmate populations. I mean, you have the freaking vice president of the United States when she was uh, attorney general in California. She she 
she tried to keep people in prison so she would have more of labor force to fight fires. Like she basically, yeah. a, a black woman is basically keeping slave labor because yeah, they're paying them, but it's like a dollar or some change. Like it's not any kind of actual money. So yeah, they're being yeah. paid, but basically you have slave prison labor fighting fires and stuff like that. And she's trying to keep people on, in prison for that kind of thing. But that's, that's not just this one example that happens throughout the entire prison system throughout the United States. Well, here's another example. Uh, we had uh, Barack Obama, who was a Democrat, who Democrats are supposed to believe in, in you know, legalizing cannabis and all that stuff, right? Uh, I remember he, he made a tweet or a statement about like when uh, Trayvon Martin uh, was, was shot, right? Mm. And he was saying that that's, you know, Trayvon Martin is someone that could look like my son. And that got me thinking about something else. It got me thinking about like how many people that look like Barack Obama, you know, young men, young black men, frankly, young minority men are in prison right now because of something that, you know, he has the power to pardon all those people, to deschedule any drug he wants. He has the unilateral power as president to do that. And they're all still rotting in jail over nonviolent. Sorry, I got a call right there my bad no no you're good it all popped up with your uh with your joe Hennish for congress and everything oh, it's very that's very official i liked it that's perfect <laughs> i should just keep that completely off right yeah right <laughs> most people listen anyway but um but yeah no, that's it's a fantastic point it's like a lot of the people that will get up there and grandstand by saying we need to do this we need to do that have the power to do it but they don't yeah whether they don't because yeah. it gets railroaded in in congress or filibuster or whatever that's one thing but for the most part people have the actual power to make these changes and they don't yeah. do anything about it yeah, and I want to tell a story. I'm going to say real quick, but it's probably not going to be real quick. I'll try to like uh, speed I mean, through it. Though. I'm in no time, but, no time crunch. No, all right, so so I'll tell kind of a long story here. When I was uh, when I was first, you know, getting a voting age and whatnot, I would like watch the governor debate and uh, and you know presidential debates and all that stuff, and I would take notes. I'd be like, you know, this issue. Do I agree with this person or that person or whatever? And this was like when I was like completely within the <laughs> duopoly, right? You had to be either Republican or Democrat. So anyway. I was, uh, early on, I was more of a Democrat, right? So I was like, you know, they believed in, you know, uh, legalizing immigration. Was, again, my parents were immigrants. I thought they were good people, right. kind of biased, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they believed in, you know, decriminalizing marijuana, which, again, made sense to me. Uh, you know, same-sex marriage. And this is when it was still illegal to do. Like, you couldn't get married to another person of your sex right you know? that's during our adult lifetimes is when that when that yeah. literally was, it was legalized like 10 years ago. <laughs> i was actually I was, I was on a flight to san francisco when it happened i landed heard the news and i'm like oh this week is gonna be lit <laughs> and well, it was it was the most fun pride parade i've been i mean being in orlando has been a lot of it was it has been great for pride yeah. but uh when, when going to uh going to san francisco and experiencing that it was it was really really cool like, yeah, sorry to, the to world didn't end or anything right which was like what half the people in the united states were basically saying oh the world's gonna end or whatever and that's right. one thing I'm really happy and proud to be a libertarian is that back in 71, 1971, when the party was formed, we were in favor of, of same-sex marriage. Our first presidential candidate, uh, John Hopkins or, or John, whatever his name is, but he was gay. And we had a, a female as a vice presidential candidate. This is 1972. Right. You know, that stuff didn't yeah. happen, right? So we were way ahead of our time. And our and one of our previous um, you know, uh, national uh, party um a Libertarian National Party uh, chair people was gay, a gay guy. You know, we just have a woman as the last one and a woman now currently. Yeah, so uh, Angela McArdle, like, I think, is the new, yeah. the new chair of LP National, which, which I, I'm not going to lie, like, the, the it's the tweets, at least, from LP National have been substantially better since uh, since she took office a couple like a week or two ago. Well, yeah. I don't want to talk about internal politics. No, no, but no, no, no we're off the air, so you and I can get to play it off the air, sure. But uh, but it's the party is started in a good direction. It keeps getting better and better and better. And we're making a lot of positive uh, changes yeah. now that are going to be you know, continuing yeah. that, that freedom movement. Yeah, one note about their social media, though. Like when that, when the, um, I noticed the day, the, the first day of the, um, the, the, you know, the convention that just happened. Mm. I looked back at the the uh, Libertarian Party of um, you know Libertarian Party Facebook page, right? Seven hundred thousand plus followers, right? We should be using that all the time. There was like one post in the last like ten days, and I was like, "What is going on here? Yeah, how are they not using this like three or four times a day?" And it's been like ten days with like one post. Right. And I was like, "Can someone please you know update <laughs> the Facebook page or whatever, <laughs> like share something or whatever?" And, and that's they've been sharing. A lot of stuff recently, which I'm very happy with that. I share it, like, you know, my local Libertarian Party, Volusia County page, and, you know, my campaign page or whatever, and, you know, I try to make comments like Spike Cohen does. <laughs> yeah, I've been, trying to, I've been trying to get more involved in, because I, I, I always, I was always kind of a, I don't know, I guess, backseat Libertarian, I guess I'll say, or like, I, 
I'm, I'm registered to the party, um, but I didn't really get involved in a lot of the different people that are involved with it. And like, I didn't really have a big, I had friends that like philosophically were libertarian, but not like registered or not participating in like the conventions, going to the meetups, stuff like that, or getting like actively involved as much. And I noticed yeah. over the past couple of years, so many wasted opportunities during COVID, especially for libertarian messaging to really take the forefront, yep. especially during the last election. Like yeah. we have, we just had all this authoritarian stuff happening, and some people are just like, so you're talking, you're talking about like, legalizing sex work. Like, okay, yeah, like, I'm for that, yes, but that's not the big issue right now. Right now, you feel losing their livelihoods and their lives due to oppressive authoritarian regimes, and you're not talking about that. So there's yeah. some messaging. So there's a lot of missed opportunities there. So, but now that um, you know that's over, I think a lot of good things are gonna be coming up, and um, it's definitely I want to follow more of that a lot closer. And I'll go back to what I was saying before, before we started talking about interpartial party politics. But going back to, uh, like, going, how I was, um, uh, what was I going to say? The, what was I going to say? Okay, so I, I was, okay. a, a, you know, I was in the kind of the duopoly, right? Yeah. So I was a, a, a Democrat. Yeah, I'm just continuing your story. From oh, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're... Yeah, so I, I was a Democrat, right? And, and I would, you know, vote, you know, do notes on debates and everything. So I was a Democrat early on. You know, a lot of their issues made sense. You know, I was I was for you know legal immigration and making it easier to come here. I for same sex marriage. I was for uh, you know decriminalizing cannabis. Like all this kind of like I don't think you know people should be you know the government should be going to wars everywhere. This is when the Democrat Party was anti-war, right? Right. I think John yeah. Kerry was like a big figure back then. I was 2004 um, candidate. So so I was I was like all this stuff makes sense. Like let's do that thing, right? So I was a Democrat, I voted Democrat, I voted for Al Gore in 2000, I voted for John Kerry, who was the first person to come out against the wars, right? This is like 2003. Uh, so I was like, you know, I voted for John Kerry in, in 2004. And then I was like, you know what? These Democrats aren't actually doing any of these things that I, I wanted them to do. Like we just got out of you know, Afghanistan, we're still kind of in Iraq. So I was like, you know, they're, these, they're not really doing any of these things. So I, I kind of looked at the, the, the other party, the only really party I paid attention to was Okay, here's the Republican Party. So I was like, you know, I, I like their less government because obviously government is the cause of these issues that I cared about, right? This mm. same-sex marriage, this, uh, uh, you know, decriminal decriminalization of, of cannabis, this, you know, these wars, this is government's fault, really. So I was like, okay, well, I want limited government. I want government out of our lives. That's what Republicans were talking about, over for liberty, for constitution, you know, limited government. So I was like, okay. So I voted for John, or John McCain in... Um, in 2008, and around that time, this is how I became a libertarian here. Uh, my best friend at the time was a libertarian, and he told me about uh, you know this guy Ron Paul, who was running as, on the Republican ticket. And I, I, I you know I watched him in debate. And I'm like, yeah, these ideas will never work. <laughs> like get rid of the, the Department of Education. No, we can't do that. You know, get out of the wars. It sounds good, but that's never going to happen either. Right. So I, I kind of like just ignored you know Ron Paul at that point, which I think most people did. But that, that seed was planted, right? Mm. So in uh, leading up to the, and I was already done. Like after 2008, I was like, okay, I, I can't vote for these people anymore. I registered NPA, no party affiliation here in Florida. So I was, uh, after being, you know, both parties kind of hypocrites, right? So I was like, uh, you know, what am I? So I found this quiz online and I think it's still available. This is like over 10 years ago now. Uh, I side with.com. So anyone listening, I encourage you to go take that. It's like a very in-depth quiz you take, uh, ask you a bunch of questions, not just yes or no, but yes because, or no because. And um, so I took that and it gives you percentages at the end of it. And it says like, I was like a 90% libertarian or something <laughs> like that. And then, like the next drop off was like the constitution party at like 70%. So there was a huge gap, right? And then like after that, there was a huge gap down too. Like Republican was like 52%. So I was like, okay, I know what I am now. I'm a libertarian, right? Yeah. So I looked into the libertarian party. I was like, oh my God, everything here makes sense. It's like they're in my head, right? And I looked <laughs> at like who was running in, in 2012 as a libertarian. It was Gary Johnson, John McAfee, um, uh, Austin Peterson. So they were yes. lead, leading candidates there. So I was like, well, oh, actually, that, that was in... That was a little later, I think. Maybe. Yeah, 2016, Austin. right? Yeah that's, yeah. What, yeah, that's right. That was when you had McAfee. Well, they ran earlier, yeah. too, maybe. But th these days have been around for a minute, but yeah. Yeah, so, so anyway, all, all this time, you know, I was I was a libertarian, and I voted for, you know, Gary Johnson both times. He was event the eventual nominee both times. But I was never registered libertarian. I was registered non-party affiliate, right? So that went on for about, like, five years where I was like that. And I was like, in 2016, I was filling out my ballot, right? So Gary Johnson, of course. There was a libertarian running here in Florida at, for U.S. Uh, US Senate as a libertarian. 
Okay, check there. Everything else is like Democrat, Republican. I, I looked into them. I was like, God, I, I hate these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's either it's either I know you have a proven history of going against what you say, so you're a hypocrite. And the, on the other side, it's like, you just have bad ideas. <laughs> right. So, so I was like, you know, I hope you're a hypocrite, but whatever. <laughs> so then I was like, okay, I got to get involved. I got I to run for office. I got to be the change I wish to see. So that's actually what got me involved into running for office. And the guy that ran for U.S. Senate here in 2016 was from my county. He was from, from the land here. So he was like, you know, a neighbor, basically. So he, like, said, okay, we have a, a libertarian party here of Volusia County. And I was like, okay, cool, I'm in. <laughs> so awesome. I, I, I changed my voter registration in December of 2016 to libertarian for the first time. So I decided to run as a libertarian before I was ever registered libertarian. Nice. Yeah, so I ran in 2018, and of course, the, the you know the issue we already talked about the uh, the you know the gun infringement uh, issue came up here in 2018, and in 2020, uh, the uh, COVID happened, and we had government shutting everything down. And I know people still today say that DeSantis didn't shut down businesses. Yes, he did. He shut down stuff. Well, especially like, like like I had friends, I have friends that work and own. Um... Like, like bars and places yeah. like that and like, like other, other, other breweries like small like breweries are some of the like one of the best i love i love like independently operated breweries i love it but a lot of them were suffering because of the whole food situation like yeah to say this he was better than a lot of governors yes on covid but he was not perfect yeah if you're grading on a scale a right but yeah. if you're grading based on frankly a libertarian based on point liberty? of view yeah no C- it wasn't there. yeah no yeah, so he shut down bars, and and I, and I knew some, you know, like some folks that worked in, you know, breweries and whatnot, and like they had like this stupid like rules where you had to have like more revenue in, in food than you did in uh, like that's how they got around. Like, oh, we're not going to shut down bars, we're going to shut down places where, you know, like like clubs and stuff where you had to, you know, where the the revenue was like less than fifty percent food. Mm-hmm. So actually, I went on this local uh, radio program here uh, in Volusia County. And I, I basically like gave out an idea. I was like, okay, so charge three dollars for a bag of chips, or stick a bubble, bubble gum or whatever, and make the beer free or a dollar or whatever. And there yeah. you go, your revenue just went higher on the food, and that would be a way to get around it. But I, I was against all that. And locally here in in Volusia County, like we have Daytona Beach, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the local side. county, yeah, the Daytona County Council were shutting down the beach. Like you can't go on the beach. Like literally vitamin D is what helps you and it's all there. Right. And like, okay, and you got plenty of room to like spread out and whatnot, but oh, you can't go on a beach anymore. Right. That and was the was, most egregious stuff. Some of the local people shutting down public areas. Like yep. you're, you're keeping people inside their homes where they're right. going to be spreading this thing a lot more. Right. And again, like, like getting out there, vitamin D is effective for this kind of thing. But then being yeah. out and like moving air, circulating air. Yeah. That's the big thing with HEPA filters and airplanes. They're circulating air through stuff. And yeah, they go through filters, but you have outside like you, it's so they're so expansive you don't need all the filters and stuff like the wind's gone in, in, the, in a split second yeah. but it's just it's a lot like i think the the main thing that i think people are starting to finally see and i think these last couple of years have really shown us that is that the people that we put in charge we expect solutions from don't know what they're doing <laughs> i agree or they're told what to do by special interests like right. we have a, we have a lot of money and you can look through the financial uh you know, the, the campaign finance stuff of, of major political parties, of, uh, of um, you know, major, you know, candidates or whatever. And it's like millions of dollars, right? Right. We don't, be we really don't sad have like... large corporations giving money to the Libertarian Party or Libertarian candidates, right? Because they, they know we're not going to, like, sell out and, like, they, oh, you could do, you know, we're not going to keep, like, the, the monopolies in place, right? We're not right. going to remove or we are going to remove these restrictions on startups, right? Right now, people that have an idea to start a company or whatever, you got to worry about all these things. You got to you know, uh, worry about like fees and licenses and like taxes at different levels and Insurance whatever. Insurance stuff. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's, there's a huge bar. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I wanted to segue into it perfectly. But talking about um, like the American dream coming here, starting a small business. Like, dude, I, I know so many like underemployed doctors from other nations. Like, or even, even for instance, even I went to, when I was in the, the fire academy, I had uh, a, one of my, uh, one of my squad mates came from Puerto Rico where he was a firefighter, with bunch of experience and like, yeah, a little bit of a language barrier. His English was pretty, pretty good. The communication was, you know, maybe not as great as it could have been, but it got a lot better. But the point there being is he brought a bunch of great skills and experience from there, but he still had to go through bunch of other schooling and stuff like that just to get to the same level he already was in a different place 
Right. They've done the local front too. If you want to start a small business, then yeah, like, like, why do you need a license to cut my hair? Like, I understand if you want to do certain things with chemical stuff like that. Okay. But here's an idea. Make it optional. If I want to get my hair dyed. Okay. Well, I may not go to the, the woman down the street who's just cutting hair out of her garage. But if I see a trim real quick, I'll go to her, give her some money and it should be, it shouldn't be an issue. You know, like, so these, they create these barriers to entry for these small businesses where you have to have, um, licensing fees, all these certification stuff, things like that, for things that probably shouldn't be an issue. Like, do you know how many lemonade stands get shut down? Exactly. I was just going to mention that. Lemonade stands. Like, I, I, I go, like, I make a point. If I see a lemonade stand, if I'm on my way to, way to somewhere, you know, I keep going there. But I always, like, when I get, you know, when I'm done with that, you know, errand or whatever, I always try to come back and, like, buy something from that lemonade stand. I always overpay, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always give them a tip. Like, I'm with the change. Uh, Here, just keep it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I always ask them why they're doing it, right? And it's usually, almost always, they're raising money for something, right? I, I, I want to, yeah. like, buy a new pair of shoes. It's, like, silly things, really. But someone is, like, you know, I want to, uh, like, my, 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 my dad wants me to do this to, you know, learn how to have my own business. I'm like, awesome. That's awesome. And I always mention, like, you're an entrepreneur. And you know what, what always happens? I never see any permit or license be posted anywhere. And I never get charged any sales tax. Right. So, <laughs> but no, I think, I think that's awesome. And what's wrong with that? And obviously they're underage, you know, they're not old enough to work. Right. Right. But here it is. Here's like everything about this is illegal. Right. But it's working fine and, and people love it. Right. So what's wrong with that? Like, why can't we have this for everybody? Right. You know, let me just... stand for all. Yeah. Well, like, like if someone wants to, if someone wants to trade their goods or services or whatever to someone else, they're, they're, these are private these private contracts between individuals, you know, whether it's a verbal contract being like, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you 25 cents for a cup of your, of your sugar, yellow sugar water. Like that's, I, I'm, I'm agreeing to that. The producer is agreeing to it. That's a verbal contract. Boom. Like why, why do we need other people involved in that contract? You know, and obviously on that level is different than if you're talking about major corporation stuff like that, but the principle should be applied to a lot more than they are. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I think that's, uh, Talking about hopefully getting rid of some of those barriers to entry, like dumb licensing fees, stuff like that, could uh, definitely it'd be helpful for a lot of people, especially those who do come here looking for that American dream, like like yeah. your parents and yeah, and so exactly. Many. And I always say that you know this country is the land of opportunity, you know, and I think that gets forgotten sometimes. I mean, we are a country of immigrants, we really are. I mean, right. I'm, again, like I'm Middle Eastern, you know, and and. Uh, you know, people come here from from Ireland, from Italy, from you know Africa. My from family, everywhere. Scotland, England, yeah. years, you know, so two generations ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The list goes on. I mean, this is this is a melting pot, a salad bowl, however you want to put it. And you know, I think it's great. I think I love it. It's you know, and, 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 and every American can kind of agree with this. We're a great country. You know, we, we have a you know great system here. You know, we're still relatively one of the freest countries in the world. You know, you can still you actually have a right to say what you want. You actually mm -hmm. have a right to you know. Uh, not have government come into your well. Never mind, that was gone. But You're right. Well, but, on paper, we have certain on rights. Paper we do, so, yeah. so we have we have the framework for certain rights, even though not all of them are being respected the through. way they should be. But right. that also, but, but the fact that we have this written down, like, hey, 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 you're not doing this. We can hold you accountable right. now. Get the fuck out. Yeah. So someone else in there. Yeah, and and, and uh, it actually brings me to another topic. Is is the uh, like I want to have a balanced budget, right? That's the B in the in um in my VC policy. Mm -hmm. So I want to have a balanced budget. Now, the, the United States does not have a balanced budget amendment. That's why we have all these, you know, deficit spending or whatever. The state of Florida literally has one job to do, the government here, to balance the budget. That's literally their job. And I think that's the way it works in most states. But it, as far as the country, the federal government goes, we don't have that. And, and people will say, like, you, do you want to have a convention of states to change the Constitution or whatever? <clears throat> I don't want to change the Constitution for anything else other than that one thing. So let's get that one thing passed. But if we opened it up right now, the constitution to it being amended, we're gonna lose our second amendment rights. You know, we're gonna lose our, our right to free speech. It's like all these things are that have already been eroded in, in effect, in, in practice, is gonna be legally eroded. Like we're gonna lose our bill of rights, like saying, okay, well, I have, I always carry this with me. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, your background kind of pulled it up. Is it yeah, passport? sorry. Anyway, it's, it's a little, it's a little, um, uh, a pocket constitution, basically. Oh, perfect. So I always carry that with me, and it's the Declaration of Independence and, and the, the Constitution. So I always carry it with me, and whenever, like, the Libertarian Party of Lucia County has a booth anywhere, we always hand out pocket constitutions, and they're, they're good. Nice. Yeah, people love those. 
So yeah, we have candy and we have pocket constitution. So the kids love both. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, like little pins and whatever. It's awesome. Like I, I love doing outreach. I Sugar love and federalism. I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I like it. Man. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, the, the Constitution doesn't get, get taught enough, you know. It's like government just grows. Government is a jobs program, you know. Government grows itself. You know, we have uh, just, it's a jobs program. Like, anytime the government, like, sees, oh, we're having, like, you know, this uh, um, this downturn or whatever. Oh, let's increase government. Let's make more laws, you know. And, and more laws require more government, right? You and know, enforcement of those laws yeah, means creating exactly. that. We create your, we have this blue police department set a monopoly on violence. Yeah. And, 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 and the people, like, usually talk about the, when they do talk about the cost of incarceration, they talk about the, um, the, the actual incarceration, like, you know, the, the food, water, whatever, uh, bed, whatever. They don't talk about the enforcement cost. They don't talk about the, the court cost. They don't talk, talk about the, uh, the welfare cost. Like, if you're make, the one making the money in your family, and all of a sudden you're in jail for the next 10 years, your family goes on welfare. You know, that, that's, that's funded by, by taxpayers, right? So then, and then you have, you know, uh, when you get out, you have a criminal record. So how do you get a job anywhere? You know, you end up, you know, not being able to get a job you had before. And that just creates an endless cycle. But um, one of the points I wanted to make for that, though, was like, uh, you know, like uh, in, in George Floyd, right? He initially, you know, he had the interaction with the police officer because he tried to uh, forge a $20 bill, I think is what it was. But anyway, so what would have been cheaper, in my opinion, was the government just saying, okay, you tried to pass the $20 bill. First of all, he didn't. I don't think so. That's why he got caught, right? Right, yeah. The, whoever was like, so, it was a bad check or a bad 20, something like that. But either yeah, way, it was like caught that. by the clerk, and they're like, no. Right. And they called the cops. So that, that's problem over, in, in my opinion. And, and if, the, if the business owner wanted to do this, like post a picture of the guy, you know, from your security camera, this guy stole $20. And to me, that's, you know, that that's over right there. Done right. With. Yeah. But no, four police officers came, right? How much money did we pay those police officers? Not, not us down here, but up in um, you know we're in Minnesota or Minneapolis or something, or he was, uh, you know, just to get to the scene, right? How much money were the taxpayers out there paying? More than twenty dollars. Just send a check for twenty dollars to the business owner and be done. Right. Well, they burned down the police department. Like, who do you think's paying to rebuild that? Taxpayers. Taxpayers. The same no. people that burned it down and were sick of it being there, like it's getting rebuilt and it's going to have all the same oppressions you burned it down in the first place for. Yeah, it, it's just a huge, not only obviously uh, of George Floyd, of human life wasted there. Mm. You have four police officers that are in jail now, which is, that's not good. I mean, I know they did something bad, but that's not good right. either, right? They shouldn't be in the situation yeah. in the first place. Right, exactly. I agree, though, like, like, like the guy, uh, I can't remember his name, but the one that likes to lean on him, like, lock him up, he killed him. Yeah, but, they're, they're but again, oh, yeah, like, the situation oh. escalated to a point, it never had to start at all. Yeah. You ever yeah, had yeah. to escalate to there, you didn't have to get to that point right. where it even was a confrontation. Over, yeah. over nine, what, 20 bucks? Come on. Yeah, exactly. In nine minutes, kneeling on him, and he was, I think, still handcuffed, I'm not sure, but he was, like, face down on the dirt. And not only that, here's another problem. This kind of goes in line with the Parkland and the, um, um, yeah, the, 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 the Uvald. Yeah, Uvald. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but the, what I happened out in yeah, New Mexico or Arizona, what, the, the, the situation where there was nine police outside the school that didn't go in, right? For 75 so, minutes, over an hour. Right. So there was three police officers around Eric Chauvin that were literally stopping people from this, this cop killing somebody. So... Here's the police with this, this mind. and again, it's not their fault. I think it's part of the system mentality that here's an officer, superior officer telling you, don't do this thing. Like you're gonna, you're gonna stand here, you're not going in. Right. And by, by just instinct and you're, you're a police officer or whatever, there's a chain of command. Okay, so you don't do that. That's it. So uh, that needs to change. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it just like the mindset, the culture of that needs to change. So. Yeah, so it, it, it all comes back to like if you want, a personal freedom comes with a lot of personal responsibility. Right. So, yes. so in cases like okay, well, if you if you want, the only way to get a, a a safe society where you don't have all this kind of violence and you've got everyone doing what they're supposed to be is totalitarianism. Outside of 1984, you're not going to get yeah. that perfect safe society. There's always going to be a risk in everything you do. I mean, if you look at the number the number of people that get killed in car accidents, like it's it's off the charts compared to most other things, you know. So, like, yeah. but we're still driving every day. It's, it's, it's important, you know. But it's important because we see it every day. We know it's right. important every day. So I have to get to work every day, or I have to go get fruit, get groceries every day. I have to go somewhere every day. So it's it's dangerous, but it's very very important. 
But when it's 3 a.m. and someone's knocking on your door and breaking it down and you don't have a firearm, it's very important too. It's not, it's hope, th thankfully it's not a situation most people find themselves in, but there have been, there have been situations I've been in where I've been very, very glad I could defend myself if I needed to. And yeah. taking that, that away from people, I think is going to, it, it, you're yeah. setting people up to become victims. You're creating victims. Yeah. And, uh, and there was another case with Brianna Taylor. She, you know, she was, when the, when the police were there serving a warrant, at, I don't know what time it was, like probably midnight, something like that. And I'm there was saying. a, uh, the, the boyfriend had a gun, right? So he shot at these people who he didn't know who they were trying to, what he thought was breaking into the, um, to the, you know, to, uh, to his house, to his right. home. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably do the same thing, right? Right, yeah. Although, I, and I, I got into a conversation with someone on social media about that. And then there was some disputing about, like, the, the situation with that. But I'm like, all right, fine, we'll move on to, like, I tried to post a number, like, like just lists and lists of people, like, no-knock raids that hit the wrong targets. And the people that are killed innocent, like, people killed because of that. Because they have no-knock raids, also, you people just sleeping on the couch, hanging out, whatever. All of a sudden, your home's yeah. getting broken into. You started changing fire because you don't know who it is. They didn't knock. Right. They just raided you. So you're shooting and assuming you're being broken. Like, why would you assume the cops would come in and start breaking into you? Especially if you're not, like... <laughs> If you're if you have to hit the wrong house too, especially right. you know, it's like okay, well, if, if, let's say let's say you know you're you're in, you do have drugs, you're part of the drug trade industry, whatever. Okay, well, you could be a gang, could be police, could be a bunch of people, but yeah. there's no knock rate thing, not announcing yourself, and then start busting in. Especially when you get the wrong houses so often, you're putting yeah. you're putting officers in needless danger. Like that job is right. dangerous enough, especially yeah. now. Yeah. You right. don't need extra danger in, on top of that. Right. And second, I, 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 your, your, the possibility for innocent people, if, if one innocent person gets killed in a no-knock raid, you should end them forever. Yeah. But they keep no. killing people. Yeah. And you, you bring up a good point. It's not just about the innocent victim, right? The person that, you know, that, that's living in the home, right? It's also the police. I don't want the police in danger. Right. You know? And, and, and uh, people like, you know, have said to me, like, you know, I'm against the police. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm for the police. I want, I want them to be safe. Yeah. I, yeah. I want them to go home, right? I, I want them to to not have as much workload to do, right? Because, you know, police, they, they go to do accident scenes and take reports. You know, the next thing they could be on is, like, you know, taking care of, like, a robbery, you know, live, live robbery, yeah. uh, domestic abuse. Like, they have, like, a litany of things they have to do, like, you know, take dealing with a panhandler. Like, the list goes on and on and on. They do too much. I want to relieve them of some of the things that they, they have on their shoulders, you know? Like, so that, that's one thing to do is like, you know, decriminalizing drugs. Okay, now go seek help somewhere else. You know, the homeless, like, again, there should be, you know, churches or whatever stepping up and providing those services for them. Um, another one is, um, you know, like, like prostitution or whatever. Again, like if, if a consenting adult ex wants to exchange sex for with another consenting adult for money, why is the government involved? That's between you two. Like, right. why is the government even like having these, you know, the, the, you know, going undercover as a hooker or a john or whatever, legalized right. already? Right. How much money are we? Are we how much money we spend entrapping people? You know. Yeah. Like, I mean, know. Like, we could talk about. We could, we could go on tension in any of this. But another good example of the entrapment thing is the FBI situation or the involvement with the plot to kidnap um, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Remember, there's, there's a big plot to, government to, to uh, kidnap the governor that was reported, but then they found out like seven out of the 12 people involved were all associated with or direct agents of the FBI. It's like, that's why that's January 6th. Well, Thomas Massey during the January 6th hearings, he actually he spoke up. He was like, what, do you need to confirm or deny any of the reports about um, agents or assets of federal agencies being present during this time? And then instead of just saying no, uh, the AG was like, uh, I, I'm not going to break norms on discussing ongoing investigations. And I'm like, well, it's this entire hearing. This entire hearing is an ongoing investigation. If you're not going to talk about the, the only questions Americans have that really matters right here is was the, were these reports substantiated or not? And instead of just saying no, you're like, no comment. It's just, it's just there's, there's transparency and accountability are the things that I want to see brought to government on every single level, whether it be local, whether it be law enforcement, whether it be federal. That is what, because that, that's the whole point of this entire experiment. The people cannot make informed decisions if we don't know what's going on. Yeah, voters being informed is another, it's a big thing for me, like really, again, at all levels. And like what I've done recently is uh, I would share like to local Facebook groups, like political Facebook groups or whatever, uh, like hobnob events or, you know, where people can meet their, their elected or candidates to be elected officials or elected officials currently if they're candidates again. Uh, I'll share one this morning, the mayor of Port Orange, um, uh, down here and like 
you know, kind of mid east Volusia. I used to work for uh, uh, for Volusia County EMS. Actually, I'm pretty familiar with Port Orange. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. That so, area. Well, That's actually how I got connected with you. After I saw your name, because I jumped in the Volusia County Libertarian Party um, Facebook, and then I said I've seen you for a while doing your thing, and then I'm like, I always talk to him on the podcast now. So cool. Yeah, anyway, yeah. 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 So when I was running for state representative, that 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 uh, the district I was running in actually included Port Orange there. So I, I was, you know, I would go to like I actually know all the. Uh, you know, the commissioner down or council people, they call them down there in Port Orange. Nice. But it's a beautiful town. I go there for like a bunch of events with the Libertarian Party myself. Uh, they got a hobnob coming up on the 30th. So I'm going to go there. Oh, very but cool. Anyway, yeah, so it, it's fun. But I, I always try to get that out to, to voters so they can make informed decisions. Like what I've seen on election day, these past like three elections have been like the local uh, political parties, like the Democrats, Republicans would have these volunteers with these voter guys. I'm using air quotes for people listening. Voter guys. <laughs> They're completely partisan. They're literally a list of every candidate who belongs to Republicans, and the Republicans are handing out that list out. And there's a list of you know this little paper, like half sheet of paper of a bunch of Democrats that are on the ballot. Here you go, and they're literally handing them out as people are going in to vote. Like I don't know, it's just probably just me because I'm crazy into this like <laughs> doing my research of candidates and stuff. But like, how do you go literally to the election, you know, to go vote? And like you're in the parking lot and you're still taking these voter guys because you haven't made a decision yet. That's crazy to me. But I mean, I guess it works because people keep voting for Democrats, Republicans overwhelmingly. But I think yeah. that's sad. I think, I think people should like, and part of my platform when I was running for state representative was to get um, these political parties off voter registration cards and off of um, uh, ballots. Why? This is my my kind of my workaround. This is my reason, right? Mm -hmm. It's because they're private organizations. Why are private organizations being on taxpayer funded, you know, documents like like voter registration cards, like uh, cool. like ballots? Like, I don't want that on there. Like, like should there be an NRA party on like candidates running on the NRA party or on the Sierra Club party? Right. Like, you could have that. Like, like uh, not government. Like, you have those clubs. You get an NRA or Sierra Club or whoever endorse candidates that's fine that, that, you go ahead and do that yeah. but they shouldn't literally be on the ballot you know private organization should not literally be on the ballot that, that's my take on that i, I agree I will for, <laughs> yeah well for the private the private um organization thing that's a very very good point with it being publicly yeah. funded stuff we, we shouldn't have right. that involvement there but also it's kind of prevent people from you can't have lazy voting with that if no one knows right. what you can't just go vote down party lines but right. i can't tell you the number of times Actually, for the last local election um, a couple of years ago, I, I, I was digging into um, – I, I live in um, a little bit further northwest um, in central Florida right now, but I'm not in Volusia County yet currently, but I'm still registered. I'm still, like, still getting mail there, and I'm still registered to vote there. So I was looking up all the local candidates for that. And I thought about making a voter guide for like, hey, here's what I think who's best on liberty. Got a couple like I think I voted for the one Democrat or Republican, and then you know, cause there, weren't, there, there weren't any um, LP candidates on that election. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? I probably could be very helpful, but I don't. I don't want to influence someone's vote. All I want to do is present right. information to them, and I want them to make their own choice. Hundred percent, I agree with you, hundred percent. And and that's kind of why. Like I remember in twenty eighteen, I, I I dove in like you know both feet, both hands, head. I was all in, right? Yeah. So in twenty, so I, I went to city commission meetings, and and like I said, like I got to know um, the the elected members of my Ormond Beach was my hometown, and then uh, Daytona Beach, and and. Um, uh, Port Orange, which were the, the 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 cities within the district I was running in, um, so I would go to like all those meetings or whatever, and um, I, I made a post about like my endorsements, right? Like I recommend so and so, so and so, and so and so, and then like I, I was I was like going to these meetings or whatnot, and these candidates I you know quote unquote supported or whatever, I was like, you know, they're not really doing what they said they would do, right? I was I was finding out on the local level that these people are not doing what they would do like the same thing i figured out on the on the uh federal level right mm -hmm. so i was kind of like okay man this is really bad yeah so so i was like okay i just want to do exactly what you said i want to inform voters i want to do stuff like this like i want to share this for other candidates for the voters and be like okay voters get informed now right so i like i'll share you know stuff on about candidates and uh you know uh there, there used to be two local political radio shows here in, in uh, Volusia County. Unfortunately, both the hosts passed away recently in the past year. Oh, no. So we kind of lost that. Yeah, Big John and then um, Mark Bernier. And I was actually on uh, Mark Bernier's show and Big John's show and call in like all the time. So that's, that's a huge awesome. loss, really. Yeah. yeah it, but yeah, it's a huge loss. But, um, you know, it, it informed voters, you know. 
and they would ask the tough questions. And I think we don't have enough of that, you know. So, so what you're doing, I think, is awesome. It's great. We need more of this. <laughs> we need we need more people interviewing candidates and, and sharing it out there. You know, I don't know if you if you uh, interview non libertarians, but maybe you should do I, that. I haven't yet. But I do want to open. You're you're the first um, person running for any kind of political office I've actually had on my podcast. Yeah, so wow. this will be episode I think sixty three is going to be the one. Um, okay. But yeah, so it's all kind of fresh and new. But I really, I'm trying to throw everything into this because actually, it's funny you you brought that up too. Is the first. The first full episode of Joe Rogan's podcast I listened through um, when I actually got into it was him interviewing Gary Johnson. Oh, wow. Uh, leading up to the 2016 campaign. So I'm like, okay. And I, I, I loved that. I'm like, oh, because sure, up to that point, I thought he was the muscle head MMA fear factor guy, right? So then, <laughs> then he had the conversation, right? And then um, so within the, the, the way that he just he he asked quite it was a conversation it was like hey let's, yeah. let's talk let's, let's get to know each other and like what I, I what i got to do on that listening to that that i didn't get to do in any of the interviews that that gary johnson had done was i kind of got to know that candidate better and then later right. he brought on tulsa gabbard he's had bernie sanders on there and yeah. like you so so i'm um, like that's something i definitely want to do so especially like i mentioned when we were talking before this too is I don't really want people that are also running for local offices as well, because people think about that we want this big change. Well, the change that gets down to you is not going to be from the top down federal, like federal government down. I mean, there'll be some that impact like travel, that kind of thing, or where you can work right. right now, which is absurd. But ultimately, it comes down to local stuff. We talked about how we think DeSantis did, you know, better versus a lot of the other governments during the COVID stuff it was because he had local local agency. So who you put yeah. in the local offices affects you far more than anything else. That's where you got to start, built from the bottom up. Hundred percent, like, yeah. Yeah, and, and to make your point even further here is like people will say like, oh, Joe, why are you running for such a high office, like state representative, you know, Congress, whatever. I'm like, that's not the high office. The high office is local. That's running for city commission for county council. Well, your yeah. vote is like 20% of the, the body, right? And there is no governor. There is no president. There is no, you know, judiciary or whatever. Like you are it. Like you are, you know, 20% of this vote of the pass of law that's going to happen, right? So it's much more impactful. It involves people's lives much more. I mean, the local stuff, that's the high level stuff. Like, you know, the 435 representatives in one body of three branches of government, federal government, you're a nobody. Like, yeah. it's literally like you're, you're less than one quarter of 1% of a vote in one side, one half of a three branch government. Like, you're nothing. Yeah. Like, that's, that, that's the like, you know, people that don't really understand, like, oh, you're, you're trying to be a big shot running for Congress. Like, no, I'm not. It's literally nothing. I'm going to be an ant, you know? If yeah. you want to be a giant, you run for local office. That's the way it should be viewed anyway. And that's a very good point. It's a very good perspective a lot of people don't really see because if you'll be the amount, the amount of influence you have on, on the office, depending on where you're at. At the federal level, you know, for the officer going for Congress, okay, you'll be, of course, you're representing your people, your say is extremely important. But when it comes down to you know what actually can affect your district, a lot more of that's being made at home. Right. Yeah. And in the federal government, again, of course, in our views, a lot of people don't see it this way. But the federal government should be so limited in scope and size and authority. Like, literally, they should be doing nothing. <laughs> right. But yeah, we, like we have them for everything. Yeah, like, we have this constitution, like, okay, let's declare a war if we're going to send our young men and women overseas, right? They haven't declared war in 70 years, I think, 70, Maybe. 80 years. And how many, yeah. like, hundreds of thousands, like, tens of thousands, at least, of, of, of our, you know, sons, daughters, friends yeah. have gone over there yeah. and died. And the ones that come yeah. back aren't whole. Yeah, exactly. PTSD. You know, people come back and, and they're, they're exactly they're not whole. And then, and then we have a government here, like the VA and whatnot. We're breaking promises to those people, you know. And then, like, kind of like the money side of it, like we're paying for these, uh, you know, for them to be on 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 ships. And I'm not saying it's it, we we do need to have them. Yes, we we do need to have oh, military. Yeah, yeah. That yes. is essential. But, Absolutely right. It is. It is essential. That but we shouldn't we shouldn't have like 800 bases around the world, you know, and and just spending like 800 billion dollars a year on it and just right. reduce it a little bit i think would be would be good i think like uh members of congress like the last um the last budget uh, uh biden wanted to increase the military spending by two percent and people were upset about that being a budget cut i'm like we're literally spending like 800 billion dollars a year he wants to increase that amount and you call it a budget cut I don't know. That my mind is right. blown at that. Well, it's almost it's almost like they're all they're all we see like CEOs of businesses. They're important to shareholders, right? And the, the idea there is you're trying to go for the, the, this like limitless growth. You're always posting higher and higher numbers, right? Well, it just it ties into at least the way I see it. It's part of its military industrial complex that uh, that we were warned about after World War II. 
And then, and so like the, these the budgets increasing, increasing. Well, that's the profits for these contractors and these weapons manufacturers right. that are they're increasing their profits up and up and up and up. But I mean, we've mentioned it several times too. If you look at what like the base government salary is for these representatives, and then look at their actual net worth, the, the disparity could not be more. Talking about people making you know low six figures from the government, which is already way more than enough. But then they're yeah. millionaires, multi millionaires, and you're like, oh, how? Yeah. Yeah, oh, your yeah. speeches aren't that valuable. What's really going on here? <laughs> and it's not your, it's not the speeches people are paying for. They're paying for their votes. No, and here's another thing, and our side to it is like, you know, they are getting money from these speeches, but they're going on Fox News, the media, right? Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, whatever, and they're becoming a, a public figure, right? And that's how they get invited to like you know the local you know Republican and Democrat clubs, and they get these five, six, thirty thousand dollars speaking fees or whatever. They sell a book and you know make millions of dollars off of that or whatever, and it's just like, you know, they, they, like the Obamas. I think were like they weren't even millionaires when they they, they you know got in the White House, right? After yeah. that, they're millionaires now. When right. what happened there? The so, irony of that too. Is, the yeah, Obama. Obama's like, oh, we're gonna get rid of Wall Street, all this stuff, and he pulls his cabinet full of Wall Street bankers. And the first thing he does when he's out of the office, he makes a Wall Street circuit giving yeah. speeches for for millions of dollars all over the place. Yeah. It's like, like yeah. look, like I, it's it's. Just the accountability and invisibility is what we really need to bring to the office a lot more. I, I will, I will hand it to Trump though. He actually lost money being president. <laughs> I think I'll, you better be the only that, one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's still a billionaire, but you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, to, to the point of that, like even in the state representative salary, it's not even thirty thousand dollars a year. It's just shy of thirty thousand dollars a year. But you'll you have to file a, a financial um, you know disclosure or whatever when you're mm -hmm. a state representative. And I'll, I'll look at some of the other you know candidates that are running. And it's like millions of dollars. Like they're worth millions of dollars and they're taking this $30,000 job for what? Yeah. Like they're, they're, you know, they're there for a reason, right? And they're not representing the people. Uh, okay, cool. So um, Joe's back on with me. This is days after I recorded the other one because yeah, technical, technical difficulties got cut off a little bit. But um, I just want to give him the chance to come on again and, and basically kind of summarize what we were talking about and uh, give him a chance to give his own outro to this. So, Joe, you get the floor, man. Yeah. Thank you again, Justin, for letting me come on again here and, and your time before as well. I appreciate it. I love your podcasts. They're all good. I listened to them like, I don't know, like four or five of them in the past, so it's been good. Thank you, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Keep doing it. Uh, yeah, as far as the campaign goes, yeah, I'm running for District 6 here in Florida for Congressional District 6. Um, there's there's just going to be me and then one of the Republicans. There's two Republicans that qualify, so it's going to be one of them, too. Um, if, you, you know, if you're in the district, it's uh, um, some of, like, Lucia County. There's um, uh, basically like the Daytona Beach, um, South Daytona, um, the land area north. It would be, like, Ormond Beach, Pearson, that area there. Uh, south of there, though, is out of the district. I know it changed instead of, you know, gerrymandering and whatnot. But yeah, like Fort Orange, Deltona is out of the district. But, you know, I'm still here, so I'm trying to, to get my name out there, Joe Hennig for Congress. Um, like, again, go back to, like, all Flagler County. But, yeah, just follow me at joehennig.com um, or um, my Facebook page, Joe Hennig for Congress. And I'll usually have, a, a like, a listing there of... Um, you know, people can help out, or if they're in the district, they could, you know, vote for me, or get a yard sign, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I'm working on that right now. But, yeah, I'm, you know, running as a libertarian and trying to bring change, you know, improvements to our government. That was what we have now. What we've had is not working. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you again for having me on. Hey, thank you so much. Hey, thank you for being on talking with me and thank you for doing what you're doing. I'm really hoping to uh, you know, see you again in office sometime. And either way, we'll love to have you on talk to you again sometime. But yeah. thank you so much. Have a great night. And I'll have links for all of your campaign and all your social media. It will be in the description for this podcast as well, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on uh, whatever media player you'd like. Description and the links will all be there for everybody that wants to check it out. So thanks you so much for checking out Tim Razor. And please check out Joe as well. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.